learning calligraphy in a homeschool co-op back when she was nine years old um, that Ben and I were both in. And she has studied everything from illumination to layout and design to backgrounds and everything in between. Um, to me, her willingness to combine her calligraphy with her own poetry. So this is um, Amelia's, and it's her poetry that's in here. Um, and her passion for the environment is a powerful example of what makes art powerful. Mary, Mary, Clara, and I have been on many adventures together over the years, um, from calligraphy conferences to engraving classes um, to in-person and on online adventures. Um, even as the daily grind pulls us um, <laughs> away from our art, Mary has been steadfast in her commitment to calligraphy and having that be a central part of her life. Sue's a boy. <laughs> I met Sue through the local calligraphy guild. 18 years ago? At least. <laughs> <laughs> she was before Ben. Well before Ben. <laughs> the Connecticut Valley calligraphers. And um, so often she has proven to be way more diligent than I. I don't know if you remember this, but there was a 30-day challenge that we had for the calligraphy guild. And she did 30 days of work. And she came in with this beautiful journal, journal at the end of it. I had like scraps of paper that were not very impressive. And this is um, Sue's book. My apologies, I haven't pointed out everybody's book. But Sue's book is a traditional format. Please feel free to turn the pages on her books. So that way you can see that once again, she was prolific and got a lot accomplished um, during this this program. <coughs> Meeting Lavelle, <laughs> I guess that was 2019, I think we said the other day. I wondered what I could possibly offer her. <laughs> From um, her introduction, I thought she had ink in her veins, <laughs> since both her mother and grandmother um, were calligraphers in England. Fortunately, she humors me and allows me to think I am able to offer something to her. <laughs> so that's our scriptorium, but there's also the honorary members of our scriptorium, which for me is Chris and Ben, because they have um, been patient and supportive. And um, if you look at how much space these books take, the last couple of weeks, I didn't have any table space in my house. <laughs> so it's the honorary members of our scriptorium, the moms and dads who did the driving, you know, our friends who were supportive, um, who helped make this, this possible and help us support us in getting this work done and this exploration. So thank you for that. Each one of us has got a little something to share. Um, everybody's going to be brief. So, um, Mary? scrolls are called magic or healing scrolls and are, in Ethiopian folk belief, considered really powerful tools to eliminate sickness and demons from people. The ill person um, would hire a Daptera. A Daptera is an ordained cleric of the Ethiopian church, but they also practice traditional medicine. They sing and dance like a cantor for a congregation, and they also perform medicinal magic. The healing scrolls have come back regularly as part of a greater healing ritual. While plant and animal medicine would alleviate physical symptoms, the medicinal scrolls were considered to alleviate spiritual symptoms. 
the mind-body-spirit healing process begins with a sacrificial meal, and the resulting goat or sheepskin is ritually stretched and dried to a thin vellum. The vellum is then cut into strips as wide as the client can afford. <laughs> but they will always be as tall as the client, and that's so that they receive healing from head to toe. The scroll is then filled with text and drawings. The Dabtar will draw the pictures and talismans onto the inner side of the scroll. Pictures were figurative and meant to represent something real, like such as St. George slaying the dragon, which was a common theme. Talismans are more abstract, represent something hidden, for example, a spirit or a demon. Included with the pictures are protective prayers and appropriate texts that would be written in black pigment. The text was written in a Semitic liturgical language called Ge'ez, which is closely relate, related to modern Amharic and more distantly related to Arabic and Hebrew. Ethiopian magic scrolls contain a mix of text and images, prayers, and incantations. The images are a mix of Judaic, Islamic, and Christian art, and, let me get, hope I pronounce it right, animism, which is a belief in the existence of spirits that are separate from bodies. Texts are often chosen based on astrological means, such as the numerical alignment of a name with an astrological sign. The incantations and other important texts you would see written in red. Scrolls are used in a variety of ways as part of the folk medicine in Ethiopia. As many diseases are believed to be caused by the actions of demons and spirits, protective scrolls are believed to have the power to drive these entities out of the afflicted individual. Scrolls would be worn on the body, they could be hung in the home, either so that they can view them while they're praying, or faced to the doorway to keep evil spirits out. Um, and some would place their scrolls under their pillow to keep them safe at night. <laughs>